uh, the grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, if you could throw that picture up that we've got here. Uh, this picture, this painting, is, uh, and some of you might know this, this is the, the scene at the signing of the Constitution of the United States. That's the name of the painting. And uh, this is uh, the representation we have of that particular event. Not the Declaration of Independence or even the forming of the Constitution. This is the signing of it that uh, would be sent out to the states to be ratified. And so you see this uh, wonderfully astute picture. You know, you've got George Washington looking all uh, uh, virtuous there and uh, Alexander Hamilton and Ben Franklin in there. And that's the extent of the names of the people in that picture that I know. Um, I, that, that, this is the representation that we have of that event. And as I'm already alluding to, I, admittedly, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a history buff. I, uh, I prefer the Wikipedia version of things. I, that's, that, was, that, that website was built for someone like me that uh, often finds myself asleep reading some sort of uh, history. Uh, so I know, I know enough about this to kind of, to, to kind of be able to uh, think about it, but not enough to like write a book or anything or maybe even give a sermon about it. Um, but uh, um, this is the representation that we have of this event. This kind of tame, uh, orderly, as I said, virtuous uh, picture of this event. Um, I don't know all the ins and outs, but I can imagine, as you probably can, that this was not a time in our country's history that was tame and uh, virtuous and uh, without uh, kind of drama and um, um, dissension and debate. Um, this particular part of the forming of the Constitution was actually stretched out over 400 years, or 400 years, four months, almost 240 years ago to the date, uh, th this month. And it, start, it started and, and went for four months. Uh, but, but as we know about the beginning of the formation of our country, it stretched out over many years the writing and the, the debating about the Constitution. And then if you spread that even more over the years and years of struggle and uh, of war and of dividing themselves from the British Empire, this was years and years and years in the making. So this particular picture, this painting, is a scant representation of the whole of what happened. This a bunch of well-dressed men signing a piece of paper was years and years and years of deeply important and vital grappling in the making. Because, as we know, the stakes were epically high at that time. The future of this new country that we live in today was in their hands. And they knew it. I show you this painting this morning because I think that this short snippet from the Acts of the Apostles that I read today about the Council of, at Jerusalem is a lot like this painting in, it, in that it's a snapshot of a much larger picture, a much larger thing that was happening with these disciples and apostles and elders at the beginning of the forming of the church. These 20 or so verses, they give us a glimpse into this dissension and debate and discussion that was going on between these people and these key players at the beginning of the church. But it's just a snapshot, just a short little look into this thing that we have no idea how long it was. We don't know how long these debates were, these reports, these discussions. We don't know how, uh, how much more was involved or how each side presented their arguments or how heated the debate got. We're given the problem, circumcision, and we're given the solution through Peter's words, but we're, we're given a piece, not the whole picture. So all that is to say it would be easy for us to read this text on days like today or to read this text on our own and, and to scoff a bit at the fact that they were debating such a seemingly throwaway topic like circumcision. It's not an issue for us today. 
It'd be easy for us to read this text and say, this, is, this text is all about welcoming people no matter who they are and because Jesus loves everyone. And it would be great. We'd paint a really wonderful picture and the story would be wonderful and we'd all walk away happy. And it's not entirely untrue that that's the message of this story. That all are welcome and that Jesus loves everyone. But if we did that, if we narrowed it down to that small scope, we diminish the significance and probably the intensity of that event that was foundational to having a place for us to stand here and say these words in a place called church today. Because the stakes at that that point in the formation of the church were epically high. And the future of the new church was in their hands. And they knew it. And they knew that this was a significant turning point in the history of the church. So let's talk about circumcision, shall we? No? No. We do actually have to talk about it, but we're going to talk about it from the biblical stance. Uh, This topic was what these church leaders were discussing. This was the big debate. Circumcision. All of these important players have gathered in Jerusalem to discuss this new topic because what was happening was all of these Gentiles were coming to believe in Jesus Christ and the good news that God, lo- that God loved them and saved them from their sins. But they weren't circumcised because they weren't Jews and so then they weren't part of this long Abrahamic covenant from way early on in the church. And they didn't follow Moses' laws. And they weren't part of this long lineage of people that were called chosen. And so Paul and Barnabas and Peter are going to all these places and preaching the gospel. And people are hearing it and they're believing it. But the question is whether or not they're actually followers of Jesus if they don't first become Jews. Or first become part of this line of the covenant. And it sounds a little odd to us today, uh, but, but what's actually being debated is, is of vital importance. Whether it should be expected of those outside of this covenant to partake in what one scholar writes as the indispensable sign of the covenant that God made so long ago. Which assured that the Jews uh, belonged to the true chosen people. It stood as their seal of election, a confession of faith, an act of obedience on the part of humankind to God's holy law. So this wasn't just some throwaway ritual that they wanted to hang on to for posterity's sake. This is the ritual that binds them together with generations and generations of Jewish people. God's chosen people. Throughout all of history. And so it would only make sense that people who intend to follow the Messiah that was sent to God's people by the very God who made this covenant in the first place, that they would join themselves together with their Jewish brothers in this ritual that links them to all of God's salvation history. The argument is good. It's well thought out. It makes sense. And a lot is at stake. Now, of course, I don't agree with the argument because I have the privilege of living 2,000 years removed from this debate and on the other side of the result. We have the privilege of being on the other side of that, a, a church that has opened itself up. But if we're looking back with honesty, it's not entirely difficult to understand that this conservative, traditional viewpoint of the Jews, if, it's, if what's bound up, in, it's, not, it's not difficult to understand it because it's bound up in salvation. The salvation that they've been promised from the very beginning. So as far as church disagreements, this isn't 
carpet versus tile or screens or no screens or, or what kind of music we play during worship or whether or not the liturgical colors all match and that they're in the right season. This is like holy baptism, holy communion, sacramental level stuff that they're, dis- that they're disagreeing about. And if we frame it that way, that this would be like debating whether or not we continue as a church to invite people into the practices of baptism and communion, not require, but pretty dang close, to join ourselves in this continuation of God's salvation in history, all of a sudden, it's pretty understandable that this debate might have been heated, long, arduous, burdensome. I mean, would you be willing to give up the sacraments in order to grow the reach of God's good news of salvation through Christ? If you thought like Paul that God was creating something new and that you were at the front edge of it, would you be willing to give up the sacraments? Now, I want to be very clear. I am not advocating for that this morning. Because I believe that we are gifted salvation, born out of the cross, through the Holy Spirit at baptism, just like William was today. But it is worth asking the question, at least today, to understand the depth of this debate and its implications on the church and its whole future. That this wasn't just some silly old men advocating for some archaic ritual that they didn't have any ability to see beyond their own tradition. This is salvation itself at stake. This is the very church's chosen future at stake. But in the midst of that, Peter hearing all of what was being said, understanding the viewpoints, knowing the implications, but also trusting that the Holy Spirit was leading him and others into something new, says this. God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he made no distinction between them and us, between Gentile and Jew. On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through grace, through our Lord Jesus Christ, just as they will. Peter says that, God chose them, too, to hear the word and to believe. And that just as he gave the Holy Spirit to us, he gives it also to them. And so does salvation come through circumcision? Does salvation come through baptism or Holy Communion? Or does salvation come through the cross of Jesus Christ? And through the gift of the Holy Spirit, then through our sacraments, like baptism and communion, and all of the the rituals and traditions of the church that are so important. And then all of those things together, our faith. Does salvation come to us in that way? Despite our denomination and the larger Christian church to this day having many, many important and worthwhile and big debates about what the church believes and how we interact with the world and how we look at salvation and the practices that we have. Holy baptism and holy communion are not on the chopping block. And we are grateful for that. They are not on the chopping block for better reasons, I think, than circumcision was at the time of the formation of the early church. But these 
early Jewish Christian rituals weren't just tossed out. Circumcision remained a practice for Jewish Christians while allowing Gentile Christians to abstain from the practice. But most important to this whole compromise, to the place where they ended up at the end of this discussion and debate, was the continued belief that all who follow Christ continue to embody that thing that we know to be true. Salvation by grace through faith. That while salvation comes through Jesus Christ on the cross, we are still called to living a faithful response to that salvation gift. That no matter what, it was God's raising of Jesus from the dead that has joined us to the new life of salvation through Christ, and then in turn opens our hearts to a lived faith and to maybe some surprising ways that the Holy Spirit might lead our church to reach further and wider than we could have ever imagined, just like it was happening at the beginning of the church that we know today. So if someone didn't have the whole picture, Maybe just a snapshot, many years from now, of our church and the larger church. And they looked at it. Would they they see an image of a church in which hearts are being opened to new people in new places and in new ways? While at the same time seeing one that is always rooted in that faith that is given to us through the foundational, everlasting promise of salvation through God in Christ? If the answer is yes, great. If the answer is no, how is the Holy Spirit leading us to be that kind of church in this day? How is God leading us to be a church that knows deeply that salvation is gifted to us through the Holy Spirit, but through Christ's death and resurrection? But also knowing that we need to continue living that faith out into the world. Again, so that we might be surprised by the depth and the breadth of God's work in this world and how far the church might go because the stakes are epically high but we know the work to be done and we know who goes with us jesus christ our savior and lord let us pray Holy God, we give you thanks for those early church leaders who had difficult conversations around practices and rituals that would continue or not. We give you thanks that you put it on their hearts to look at what was important. And that is the salvation that is obtained through the cross of your Son, Jesus Christ, that is given to all people, no matter who they are, Jew or Gentile, We give you thanks for the ways that your church has grown and flourished in all places of this world. Continue to do that work within us and within this place so that we might be surprised and filled with wonder at the ways that you work through us and bring your love to all people. We pray this in your saving In the grace of your Son, we pray pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.